So you might be surprised a bit that I'm standing here and doing an introduction. Um, Luca Pegoraro uh, initially invited Natasha, our today's speaker, but due to unforeseen family situations, he cannot attend today in person. So I'm going to do my best to introduce you. I now long you for a very long time, yesterday evening when her flight arrived. Uh, <laughs> so we had a whole train ride to Zurich, Central Zurich, to talk about um, her past career and what she's doing now. So I'm going to try to summarize that. And I'm going to start from the most recent points in um, because that makes it easier for me. Um, so for two months now, I think you are the curator at the uh, in Botany of the Natural History Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. Um, and at the same time, an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen. And in the meantime, you also got appointed uh, section head of botany, if I got it right. So a career in two months, I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> and be, well, that's, that's kind of fresh out of the box, your job. Um, you told me that the museum is being built up at the moment, your institute's building is being renovated. So I guess um, you're facing problems like putting people into rooms. We all know that from WSL, there never is enough. Um, and before your current job, you worked, I think, 14 years, if I got it right, um, in Wales. You were the head of science uh, in, the natural, in the National Botanical Gardens of Wales and the senior lecturer at the, now, that is the most challenging thing. Aberystwyth? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Aberystwyth University in Wales. And now I'm very delighted to give you the word and uh, hand over to your talk. Thank you. Okay. So can everybody hear me okay? And hopefully people online can as well. Let's just put this away. So it is really lovely to be here. It's lovely to be here in person. It's lovely to be presenting to a real audience of people um, and lovely that it can also be online as well. Um, so it's a um, real pleasure to tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing. So a lot of this research is uh, work that I've been doing over the last 14 years at the Botanic Garden in Wales, but I'm also going to be telling you about some of the new plans and research ideas uh, in the new job at the Natural History Museum of Denmark as well. Um, there's going to be a strong focus on DNA barcoding and eDNA and metabarcoding, and I know that's something that, uh, that you're working on here as well in terms of developing facilities. So I'm going to concentrate particularly on giving some case studies of some of the work that I've done, uh, which might be uh, interesting to find out about. Um, so the, the actual work that I do like, is just about identifying species. Um, my training is, is a terrestrial ecologist. I'm a trained botanist uh, with a taxonomic background. Um, and actually, over time, I've just moved more to doing that with DNA. So, of course, we know how important species identification is um, for both pure and applied ecology. Um, and obviously, DNA can be used in any situation where morphological identification is just difficult or impossible to do. Um, and so the idea of DNA barcoding um, uh, arose with Paul Hebert at the University of Guelph in, in Canada. Um, and I put this in just to kind of remind people that this idea of DNA barcoding and making reference libraries for barcoding is all about making databases so that we can identify species, but it should be open science. It only works if everybody makes their data available very readily so that it can be shared. Uh, and it also needs agreement in terms of the regions of DNA which are used for different taxonomic groups. Increasingly, this is a field which is moving and transitioning from a marker-based approach using PCR to a genomic-based approach where we're doing whole genomes or genome skims and using PCR-free approaches. But those principles of it's still about identifying species and you can only do that if you've got a reference library to begin with um, still hold true regardless of the techniques being used. Um, so I started doing DNA barcoding and particularly making kind of reference libraries for floras um, 
many years ago um, and we started off working on the floor of Wales um, and I led the project that made Wales the first country in the world to DNA barcode all of their native flowering plants and that sounds really impressive but we've actually got a tiny flora there's only 1,143 native flowering plants in Wales so um, and we also have a country in Wales which is incredibly well characterized um, so it's easier than maybe some of the other the countries. Um, and since doing that, we've done an awful lot of applications and training and barcoding as well. And that's ranged from uh, things within country to providing training and how we can use DNA barcodes to fight wildlife crime in Kenya and Mexico, um, but still all using the same techniques. Uh, just to give you an example of the, um, we finished DNA barcoding the Welsh flora, and then we went on to DNA barcode the rest of the UK, which again sounds impressive, but we've now got the sum total of 1,482 species, so it's still not that big. Um, and we DNA barcoded that using three DNA barcode markers. We have RBCL, MATK, and ITS2. We've got pretty good coverage for the whole flora um, using those three markers. Um, we normally do specimens in triplicate. Um, at least sometimes more a little bit less but an interesting feature about the reference libraries which we've made is we've almost entirely used about 80 percent used herbarium specimens and this is an amazing way of really accelerating the creation of reference libraries and the herbaria of the world are an amazing resource in order to create and use these reference libraries uh, we used a marker-based approach, but there's some now really good studies which have used herbarium material for genome skims as well and creations of reference libraries like that. Um, and it doesn't, um, the age of the specimen makes a difference. It's a really linear relationship, actually. So this graph here um, goes up to about 2010, which are our newest samples. We actually went back just using standard DNA marker approaches full length to about 1827 um, samples of that age, but it kind of goes down over time. But basically anything from 1950s onwards worked really well. It doesn't work as well as fresh material, but the advantage of having the specimens identified and verified with correct location information outweighs the reduction that you have um, in, in, um, in success. So we would always go to Herbaria first of all to make our reference library and then supplement that with fresh collecting where we need to. Um, but the main application of that um, and what I've spent a lot of time doing is we then do a whole range of DNA metabarcoding applications. And the principle that we're using for that is the same across the different types of techniques we've been using. So we collect samples from the air, soil, insects, honey, extract the DNA. Uh, and we typically use two markers. Most of the work we've done is on plants and we typically use RBCL and ITS2. To sequence that on an Illumina MySeq, and then absolutely critical thing, compare it to our reference library. Um, your identifications are only ever as good as the reference library that you start out from. Um, and I review a lot of papers where people don't quite like the bit where they actually have to have good reference libraries to begin with. Um, so that's the basic principle that we've used for a lot of the work we've been doing. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few examples of the types of things. Um, so we did a big project uh, working with a number of partners um, look in an aerial pollen DNA metabarcoding. So this was a project called Pollagen, and we were using Burkhart samplers, um, which are an active uh, sampler, and we had those on a set of locations within the UK to look at pollen um, coming from the atmosphere. And the aim of the project was to relate that, um, first of all, to the phenology of what was happening on the ground. So could we act accurately track what was happening with pollen over time? And then secondly, could we relate that to incidents of hay fever and asthma uh, using hospital records and also prescription records for hay fever, um, antihistamines and things like that? Because um, obviously this is a big problem. Um, 
if hay fever is something which is horrible, but actually if you have asthma, which is exacerbated by pollen, then it can be, can be fatal. Um, and the results actually worked really, really nicely. So our early papers showed that there was a really good link between the phenology of first flowering of plants and the appearance of those plants in our um, spore samplers, our pollen samplers. Um, we then found that there were interactions between the amount of pollen in the atmosphere um, and uh, asthma and, and hay fever um, issues. And the key thing that we were interested in doing was we were concentrating on grasses uh, because at the moment when people do pollen forecasts using microscopy, you can't distinguish between the individual grasses particularly well. So what we wished to do was, can we use barcoding to increase the discrimination? And we can then separate the grasses into those which are more allergenic and those which are less allergenic. And we found that we could do that. Um, and then the final kind of piece of work with that was looking at how do we model the deposition of pollen and how the pollen moves around and can we use that to predict the severity um, of the grass pollen season based on our meta barcoding and our other data. Um, so it shows that um, the types of things that we can do with these DNA meta barcoding approaches and the types of kind of range of applications. Um, and then another example at the kind of other end of the spectrum. So this is a much more ecological example. Um, and this is a piece of work in progress. Um, so I just wanted to show you some of the initial slides from that. Um, so this project called Grasslands for Life was actually commissioned um, by the um, Conservation Agency for Wales, which is called NRW, Natural Resources Wales. And what they wished to know was, could we monitor grasslands more quickly using eDNA approaches compared to using uh, morphological sampling using uh, plant surveys? Um, and this is mostly because within Wales, they have a whole set of grassland sites. It's some of our most important areas for nature conservation, but there simply is not enough workforce to monitor those sites in order to know whether they're in good condition in terms of their conservation value. In terms of the research, I was interested in knowing how can we get an idea of the total biodiversity of a site, combining plants and animals and microbial communities, and could we look at the drivers of the composition of those sites along different environmental gradients across Wales? Um, so we had a nice example where we had a very applied, you know, survey based, you know, want to use this for monitoring um, and the research element, which I was interested in seeing how we could take that forward with metabar coding. So we had a series of grassland sites um, throughout Wales, um, different, mostly relating along different moisture gradients. A lot of these grasslands, it's in Wales after all, it's pretty wet. A lot of these are wet grasslands. Um, some of them are hay meadows. A lot of them are really species rich. Um, and we also looked at some amenity grasslands within health board sites as well as a comparison. So some of the, just the initial results for the plant sampling. Um, so the graph on the um, right-hand side that, this is an above ground vegetative survey, just counting the plants morphologically. And then we have a winter and summer DNA metabar coding sample. And we were actually surprised at how similar the results were. So we can get really good comparisons between the above ground survey and what we find with the plants. What was quite nice was we also found a few rare species, uh, which are key indicators of those community types. And we found those with the eDNA um, sampling as well. So that's for the plants, but we're also sampling uh, with the same soil sample, the animals, mostly the arthropods, uh, fungi, and the microbial communities. Um, and we're just working on that at the moment. We're then going to have a challenge, which is how do you go from a kind of taxonomic approach with the plants and the fungi right through to looking at the microbes with OTUs? And how do we bring all of that together? Um, so that will be the piece of work for the future that we need to look at. 
Um, and these are just some results which literally uh, Laura Jones, who is working on this project back in Wales, um, just sent me through the other day. So I thought I would share those with you. Um, so these are the meta barcoding results for all of the different grassland types according to their community called the MVC, which is a community designation system in the UK. Um, and so of all the different grasslands, we can get a really nice list of the typical grassland plants and we're getting pretty nice differentiation between the different grassland types. If we just pick out one site, so this is a type of wet grassland, like a mire grassland, um, and just looking at a range of those sites within this one community, again, we're picking up nice uh, differentiation of the different sites, and we're getting results that we would expect to see. You know, this is looking like these grasslands would be expected to look at, but we're picking up a few rare species which is nice to see. So to give you one example, a characteristic species of this habitat is Saxiza pretensis, which is devil's bit scabious. And we're picking that up in all of the sites where we were recording it uh, morphologically as well. Um, and this is quick to do. Um, this is taking a soil sample, doing transects, quadrats, and then sampling within those. So this is a really quick technique in order to get a lot of biodiversity data. But actually, the area where I've done most work um, in terms of, of my research is looking at plant pollinator interactions. Um, and again, in a very applied sense. So we're interested in the fact that obviously pollinators are declining. They have a whole range of stressors within their environment, which are all interacting to cause declines. And one of the key factors is loss of flower-rich habitat for foraging. So this causes pollinator decline for wild pollinators, but also potentially ill health for managed pollinators like honeybees as well. And we work on both honeybees and wild pollinators. Um, and we've done a whole range of different studies, but the general question we're asking is what plants do pollinators visit? We're not looking at pollination as such, we're just looking at visitation. And we want to know at how we can look at how that is structured through different communities and through time. Um, and we can retrieve, um, we use pollen as our indicator here, and we retrieve that pollen either from the bodies of the pollinators themselves, from pollen loads, or also from samples of honey. And this isn't a new thing. So people have been doing these types of um, observational approaches, either directly or looking at pollen. Um, so for example, melissopalynology is the typical technique used to identify the floral composition of honey. Looking at pollen down a microscope, we're just doing the same thing with DNA. So I want to give you just a few examples of the types of things we're doing and the types of uh, questions which we're interested in looking at. Um, so first of all, a honeybee example. So one of the things we were interested in was looking across the whole of the UK, uh, what plants do honeybees forage on? Um, and we was also interested in looking at how that had changed over time. So in 2017, we did a survey of honey samples across the whole of the UK. It was the biggest survey done since the 1950s. And we compared that to a data set from 1952, where 885 honey samples had been collected and analysed with microscopy. Um, and we did this as a citizen science project. So we asked beekeepers to send in samples of honey. Um, and so inevitably, our kind of distribution of samples is, is not as it would be if you sampled this in a systematic way. Um, it just happened to be that we obviously talked to lots of people in Wales. And then we did a call out on a television program in the UK called Gardener's World, which is really popular. But it's obviously really popular with people in the southeast. Um, so we got lots of samples from there. Not so many from Scotland. Um, so we've got a kind of England, Wales uh, sample set. We looked at where people's apiaries were located, uh, because the lovely thing about working with honeybees is, first of all, you know where the hives are. Um, you know a lot of information about what the honeybees are and what they're doing. And you can use those to kind of sample out in the landscape and find out what plants 
they're bringing back. Um, and the distribution of the apiaries, so on this um, graph on the left-hand side, showed that most of the apiaries were in improved grassland, um, and that makes sense because that's the uh, major habitat type of the UK. And as you might expect, the next most abundant habitat that the apiaries were in uh, was within uh, suburban areas, which makes sense with people having their hives in their gardens and, and things like that. But we've got pretty good representation of the habitats of the UK uh, based on where people had placed their honeybees. Um, so if we look in 2017, this is the results of the DNA work. Um, and it kind of illustrates a nice kind of profile of what you can do with the DNA metabarcoding data as well. It isn't fully quantitative. And so over time, we've uh, kind of prevaricated on do we just use it as presence absence data, but actually that's pretty biased because then you kind of you weight rare species more than you potentially should. Um, and clearly it's not fully quantitative. So the type of way we analyze this data now is typically something like this. Um, so the actual size of the bar on this plot is frequency. So this is the number of honey samples that plant will be found within. And then we'll use categories of abundance. Uh, so we just use four categories for the honey. So red is predominant. Um, so what that means is within those samples, greater than 45% of the DNA was that particular sample. So we uh, take our honey sample uh, and the results from the barcoding and we look at that as a kind of a relative proportion. And even then we put that into broad categories. Um, and actually, this is how people traditionally look at pollen within honey samples as well. Um, so what we find is within our honey samples in 2017, we identified 157 different plant species, um, but actually only a only a small number of those were present in over 5% of the samples. And we find a few key plants, um, Rubus fruticosus, Trifolium repens, Brassica, which is mostly the crop oilseed rape, things like hawthorn and apple, uh, which are the real major players in the diet of a honeybee. And then if we compare that to 1952, um, actually a lot of the plants are the same, which is what we would expect. So 66 plants were found in 1952, 47 of those matched. And there is an overall really good correlation between the abundance of the plants from 1952 and 2017. The same four plant taxa are still the most important plants which are used by honeybees. But what we found that was really interesting is that the abundance in use of those major plants, just using our really broad categories, has really changed over time. And the pattern of that change completely reflects agricultural intensification within the UK. So in 1952, um, honeybees mostly were using white clover. And if you go to the beekeeping literature, um, all of the beekeeping literature of the 1950s, which there's a lot of, this is after the war, lots of people were beekeeping as a source of um, sugar. Um, all of the literature says that white clover is the most important plant for honeybees. But by 2017, that has gone down in importance. And instead, uh, Rubus fruticosus, so brambles, blackberries, they're now the most important plant that honeybees are using within the landscape. And this makes sense. Um, obviously, as agricultural intensification has gone on, the use of more inorganic um, fertilizers and herbicides, which are selective, the amount of white clover in the landscape has decreased. Silage production has increased uh, without a lot of um, white clover. So whereas white clover would have been such an abundant plant in pastures, it has now decreased substantially. And if we look at the countryside survey, our results reflect the known changes in abundance of the plants in the landscape. 
So we think that the honeybees have moved from clover onto brambles, but there's implications of that. White clover is thought to be a better nutritional source for honeybees than potentially brambles, um, which is something that we can also kind of consider. We can also track the emergence of a new crop. So oilseed rape brassica um, wasn't grown in the 1950s. It started to be grown in the 1960s and onwards, mostly in the 1970s, and started to become a major crop type. And the use um, within the honeybee diet increases significantly over time, as obviously this now becomes an available resource. Now, clearly, this is a double-edged sword because honeybees are now using this more, but also, depending on the pesticides being used on that, it can have huge implications for their health. Obviously, those are wild pollinators as well. And then a final interesting result, we track the emergence of an invasive species, Himalayan balsam. So again, this was first introduced in the UK in around kind of 1835, but it had a low distribution. And now it has increased and increased so that uh, river courses and fields can be covered in Himalayan balsam, in Patience glandulifera. Um, so nature management conservation practices would remove this. Um, it can uh, outcompete native plant species. It can also block up water courses. But actually, it is a really, really important pollinator plant, uh, both for honeybees and wild pollinators. It flowers at the end of the season and is a really important late summer source for both honeybees and wild pollinators. So it's interesting of uh, if we take this out, well, what do we replace it with in a depauperate environment for biodiversity? Um, so a few more examples. Um, so this is uh, examples of some work we did on hoverflies. So I've just put in this, uh, um, but I'm not going to talk um, too much about this particular example. Um, so we looked again at our, our wet grassland types. So these are these myers um, and these, uh, it's called Circeo molinetum in a kind of European context. And we looked at hoverflies. And so this was a PhD conducted um, by Andrew Lucas here. And he was interested in looking uh, throughout the season and what plants honeybees were using sorry, um, hoverflies we're using. And this is just looking at one group of hoverflies, Aristalis, the drone flies, at two points in the season. So uh, the top one is early in the season where we've got three different types of Aristalis um, flying and they're using just mostly one source of plants and that is Rubus, Rubus fruticosus. Then later in the season, we have more different hoverflies on the wing, and they're using a greater variety of plants, uh, including Saxiza pretensis, which is our indicator species for this grassland type that we pick up with our eDNA as well, and lots of thistles. But what was quite interesting for us in terms of a management implication of this particular example is that these are really, really species rich in terms of plants, grasslands. So they're a real high priority for nature conservation in Wales. And the management prescription for these sites would be to remove the bramble from the edges in order to maximize the amount of space for the grassland. And actually what we're saying is no, please don't do that. You know, we really do need our hedgerows and then a really good margin of brambles and then our grassland in order to provide enough forage for our pollinators, but also brambles are such an important key, keystone species for so many other, whether it's uh, dormice or mammals or birds as well. So our actual results have quite kind of practical applications in terms of the management of these habitat types. Um, and then just another couple of examples. So uh, this is some work done by um, a PhD student of mine, Abby, who handed her PhD in yesterday. Um, so she's like celebrating today. Um, and what Abby was looking at is pollinator foraging in gardens and amenity areas because one of the things we're interested in is, well, how can we look at the value of gardens and how can we improve those for pollinators? So are there certain plant species that we can recommend to gardeners and growers? 
um, but also how do pollinators interact in these types of habitats compared to say agricultural habitats. Um, so we looked within the Botanic Garden in Wales and it's a really nice study system to investigate these questions because what we have is, um, so this is a map of the Botanic Garden in Wales at the top and in yellow are the horticultural planted areas and then there's lots of big lakes um, and then the green areas are grasslands, which are all managed as meadows. So they're actually some really nice hay meadows. And then we have woodland areas and hedgerows. And then next to that is um, an organic farm, which is a national nature reserve, which has grasslands and then lots of linear hedgerow features as well. So we had a nice range of horticultural plants, but within a really big kind of agricultural setting with very few other gardens and horticultural areas surrounding us. And so Abby did transex um, throughout the year. So on a monthly basis, looking at different types of habitat transect within these different areas. So some of her results, so first of all, in terms of the kind of practical uh, application questions that we were interested in, we wanted to know, well, okay, what are the major plants used um, and how can we use those to recommend those to, to sort of gardeners and landowners? Um, now, this comes to a problem that we, we consistently have with the um, idea of our, our project, which was to be very practical and give advice to people on the plants they should grow in their gardens. Um, but from our honeybee results, it was, uh, well, Himalayan balsam, um, brambles, um, which not that attractive to the average gardener, or we cannot legally recommend somebody to grow. Um, and to be honest, it's not that much better with our wild pollinators either. So for this particular study, Abby is looking at honeybees, hoverflies, bumblebees, and solitary bees. And if we look across all of those groups, what are the most abundantly used plants? It's those um, on this picture here. Um, so thistles, very, very popular, knapweed, um, dandelions, um, and also things like cat's ears, uh, buttercups, really important for the hoverflies, and bramble. It doesn't matter what we sample or, you know, when uh, rubus fruticosus is already always really important. And then the umbellifers are really important for the hoverflies as well. But all of the studies that we do, we tend to find that native or plants closely related to native plants always become the most important. They always come out higher than the horticultural plants. We have also done some work looking at different um, functional groups as well. So this is also uh, some of Abby's results. Um, so we compared our hoverflies and we compared that to bees and we find a real significant difference between what bees and hoverflies are doing in their landscape. Um, and then if we divide the bees into different groups, we see that the bumblebees and honeybees are quite similar, but the solitary bees, as we might expect, given that they're a very, very variable group, um, are very variable in the plants that they're using. Um, so the data we're using here is the metabarcoding data, and we're looking at relative abundance. So we're looking at percentage of um, total reads as our measure. We can also divide the uh, bees and hoverflies into functional groups as well. So we had a look for bumblebees at the short tongue and long tongue, and we find there's a significant difference between the plants that they're using. For the hoverflies, we divided them into different categories based on um, the ecology of the larval um, type. So hoverflies can be carnivorous, detritivorous, fungivorous in terms of their larval stage. And again, we find significant differences between um, the plant use as adults, depending on the ecology of the larvae. If we have a look at the uh, solitary bees, again, we find really significant differences based on the size of the bees. 
So we find that as we're delving more into the ecology of these species, um, there really are sort of big substantial differences, which are really difficult to detect just using observation, but which we're able to pick up using our DNA metabarcoding. And just to give you a, just a kind of visual representation of the types of results that we can get and that we're trying to get our head around. Um, so this is data for the whole year um, based on the different transects that Abby was looking at. Um, so on this one on the top, so the insects are on the left hand side and their plant interactions are on the right hand side. Um, so this is grassland within the nature reserve, so managed as a meadow, and this is the network for over the whole year. Then below is grassland within the botanic garden, which is quite similar, similar kind of habitat type. And um, we can see there's a few key things dominating. So the yellow here is buttercups. We've also got red clover and we've got rubus again, and angelica heracleum, so the umbellifers. If we compare this, so this one here on the right hand side, this is the botanical areas. These are the horticultural areas of the botanic garden. So what we're finding is that if we look at the major plants, we pick up the uh, native plants as most important. But we think that the horticultural plants actually have a really important role to play, but just as a much lower level. And we think these horticultural plants may really increase diet diversity for pollinators, particularly at certain times of the year. And you can see the complexity, both in terms of that there's a much bigger range of insects in the horticultural area over a year, but the range of the interactions is much more complicated as well. And so we're working at how do we dive into those types of relationships. Um, and then kind of even more applied in terms of looking at our plant pollinator interactions. We've also been taking a look um, at annual seed mixes. Uh, we know these are really popular. So we know people like planting annual seed mixes in their gardens or in amenity areas, and that they often do this because they want to attract pollinators. So we had sort of two questions. First of all, well, does it work? Are they attractive to pollinators? And then we was also interested as how does that actually affect the ecology of the networks that we see? So how is it influencing what's happening kind of outside the plots? So this was a PhD conducted by uh, Lucy Witter, who you can see on the top right hand side there. Um, and this is probably one of the most beautiful experiments we've ever done. We did it right in the center of the botanic garden so that all of our visitors could see it. And we took a whole range of different commercial annual seed mixes and we tested those for their attractiveness to pollinators, both using time counts with observations and then collecting the pollinators and DNA metabarcoding those to find out what pollen they had on their bodies. Um, and what's quite interesting is when we compare the approaches, they, as you'd expect, give quite different data. So the observational approaches are one moment in time. You know at that point in time what plant that pollinator is sitting on. With the metabarcoding, we obviously have a longer time period. We know what that pollinator has been doing for a foraging trip because of all the pollen on its body from uh, what it's done before it has cleaned itself off or returned to its colony, um, or if it's a hoverfly, cleaned itself off and eaten the pollen. We don't necessarily know how long that time period is. So if you pick a pollinator at any one point in time, we don't necessarily know how long that pollen has been on its body for, but we think probably not very long. Um, so we can pick up a much greater diversity of interactions and we can pick up a kind of longer time scale using metabarcoding approaches. Um, and just a few of just to kind of illustrate some of the results. Um, so these are just some NMDS plots looking at the overall plant composition found on the insect bodies and then just dividing that into our different um, categories. So on the top left, if we compare bumblebees and hoverflies, we see that they're really using quite significantly different uh, components of the seed mixes. 
On the um, B here, this is looking over the months that we've sampled. And we can see from the DNA results that we get a really lovely kind of phenological progression as they use different plants over the season. We had two different sites that didn't seem to make a lot of difference. And then we had our different treatments, uh, which were supposed to be good for pollinators. So these are the actual seed mixes themselves. And we found they didn't actually make a lot of difference. And the reason why they don't make a lot of difference is that pollinators only actually use a very small proportion of the plants in the seed mixes. So they have their favourites. Um, so there's a small number of key plants which are important, and they tend to be found in all of the different seed mixes. But the whole diversity of the seed mix is normally only about 10, 15% of the plants they're actually using. Um, Lucy also designed her own seed mixes to see could she make a better mix as well, but I, I won't show those here. Um, and then just another illustration of the types of analysis we're doing. Um, because we've got this kind of longer time period, we can divide the plants that we find on the pollinators into ones which were inside or outside the plots. And you can't do it exactly because some things are obviously in both and we can't always get to species level with the DNA metabarcoding. But for a lot of the plants, you can get quite an interesting idea. And so these graphs here for bumblebees and hoverflies um, are over each month, the plants which were being used inside the seed mix plots and then which plants were being used outside. And if you have a look, say, at the hoverflies, this makes sense in terms of what we're seeing. So in June, when the seed mixes haven't quite got growing yet, uh, the hoverflies are happily using brambles and buttercups from outside. And then as the brambles start to finish and the plots start to get going, the hoverflies start to use things within the plots more, but still at a lower level compared to the bumblebees, who really, once these plots start to really get flowery, they start to use um, inside those plots a lot more. And obviously these are insects caught within the plots. So obviously lots of them might be doing other things outside. This is just what is inside and the relative proportion. Um, and then the final example of the things that we are interested in doing is looking at things like uh, floral constancy for our pollinators. Um, so normally, particularly uh, if people do microscopy studies, if they take a pollinator and they look at all the pollen on its body, they normally see quite high floral constancy. There's normally just one or a couple of different pollinator types. And if we look at that within our agricultural grasslands, if we look at that within our meadows and even within our horticultural areas, we get the same pattern that mostly an individual pollinator has one type of pollen on its body or just a couple of types. It's florally constant. The pattern we get for the seed mixes is really different. So within um, a particular individual, a lot more of the individuals for both the bees and hoverflies have a greater percentage of plants on their bodies. So on this graph here, if it's 100%, it's you know, all one type, but actually most of them have like 40 or 50 instead. So we think we're actually seeing that the pollinators are using these seed mixes in really quite a different way in terms of actually when they visit them as a resource. And that's what we're unpicking at the moment. And then the graph on the right here is each of these little lines is the major plant being used by a particular pollinator. So I'm not going to go into the kind of the results of this because we're still trying to work them out. But it's quite interesting that using these metabarcoding approaches, we can go from the level of the individual right through to the level of the group, the functional group and, and community. Um, and then just to finish up, um, this is work which is being finished up from the work in Wales. Obviously, I've moved to a new institution, so there's lots more exciting things we're going to be doing, um, but still working on the same principles. Um, so I'm interested in making some new barcoding resources, both for Denmark, but also working within Greenland. 
Greenland is a fabulous place to work for plant pollinator interactions because there's not very many plants and there's not very many pollinators. So you can really unpick what is going on in a, a way that's hard, even within a kind of temperate context. Um, and there's some great work being done, particularly in Helsinki, already starting to look at these things. So that's something that we want to explore. Um, I'm also curator of Herbarium C, which has 1.4 million herbarium specimens. Um, so my scope for making reference libraries and answering questions is much bigger. But I also have the challenge of how do we just unlock the potential of these herbarium specimens in the future? And then the final challenge, which is what I'm now interested in exploring, is um, how do we move from the like marker and PCR based approaches that we're doing? Um, and how do we move then into looking at more genomic methods? So the funding applications I've been putting in at the moment are all looking at making reference libraries using genome skims rather than individual markers. But for the meta barcoding, I still want to use markers, mostly because I know it works. And I want something that works over pushing the boundaries of the techniques right now. Um, but this is something which, you know, how we get this working with a genomic approach um, is, is kind of is the next challenge, really. But what it comes back to, and my kind of final point, is that however whizzy the techniques seem, the actual principles don't change. So if we want to do a genomic approach for, say, looking at plant pollinator interactions or soil sampling, we still need a reference library. You've still got to go back to knowing what those things are on the ground. Obviously, we can use OTU approaches, and obviously that's really appropriate for certain techniques. But the type of work we do is building these kind of intricate networks where we want to know exactly who all the individuals are. So how we move into maybe using more genomic approaches whilst retaining that fine scale detail that we need is the challenge for the future. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you very much.